Let's move to the Word of God here. Luke chapter 8 and verse 26. And it says, They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he'd worn no clothes. And let me just say that nudity, public nudity, often accompanies demonic activity. And so just know for anybody pushing in that, sometimes that's a sign of, of, of the devil at work. And so I'll just leave that there. And he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus, and they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and he returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Let's pray. Father... You're alive. You're at work. Your power makes a difference. We give you the situation that, that happened at the school this week. We've already seen you move. We've already seen you doing things there that only you can do. And so we continue to believe for that. But Lord, we also pray as we prepare to go into this message and talk about some things maybe some of us are uncomfortable with, but Lord, they're important. And so we just pray that you'll help us see what we need to see, know what we need to know, and apply it as we should apply it. And we'll thank you for it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I just uh, went through the, the aggravation of getting new cell phones. How many of y'all enjoy spending like two days getting new cell phones? And so as I was going through it, I, I was just thinking about ways we adapt to technology in our life. And I found out, a study, that there are five different ways people respond to technology. There's, there's one that they say is about 2.5% of the population, and, and they call these people innovators. And so when Apple is, is coming out with some new product, you know, and you see they got a stage and the flashing lights and they got a band playing and, and all these people that are in the audience going, woo, you know, as they're announcing, oh, wow, I got to have that. Those are innovators. They're people that are part of that industry. They are in the center of all the technology. Then there's what's called early adapters, and that's about 13 and a half percent of the population. And, and, and early adapters are people that are close to the tech field and what's been developed is something they need for their work or something they're doing or they're just the people that are the first in everything. And so that's, that's the early adapters. And then there's what they call the early majority, which is about 36 percent of the population. And they are, they are the ones that, you know, they wait a little bit because they're just not sure. And, and so they're wanting to make sure it's going to take. They, they want to be positive. They really need an app that tells them the temperature of their refrigerator while they're at work. Is this really something that's necessary for my life? And they're usually pretty quick to say, yes, I need to know what, what 
is happening in my freezer, even on vacation. And so they, they get that refrigerator with that tech in it. And, and so they're early adapters. And then there's the, what they are, are call early majority. And then there's late majority, which is about another 36% of the population. And they're the ones, usually they will come around per, relatively quick but it's only because somebody gave it to them for Christmas. They're not lining up to buy it, but it's, you know, it's kind of forced on them, kind of pushed on them. They, they don't want a cell phone, but then their job makes them get a cell phone. So this is the late majority. And then there's our favorite group, the laggards. How many of y'all feel like a laggard? About 16%. I'm not saying Ron Simmons' name for anything in the world right now. We're all thinking it, but we're not saying it. But a laggard is, you know, you're just gonna, you're just gonna have to pray for them, and they'll probably, maybe, eventually, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be after they find it in the the clearance bin for fifty cents, and they're the last people on earth without having one of those if they adopt. And and so I'm, I'm sharing all this because we've got a story here that's kind of similar to the way people adopt the technology. We learn that it's kind of a similar way that people relate to Jesus. Because not everybody comes to him at once. We get these stories that, that Jesus called the disciples and they leave their nets and they just leave their boats and they start to follow Jesus. But we, we, we get a story here today that, that it, it takes a little longer for some people. And it's good for us to realize this and it's, it's good for us to understand exactly what's going on here. And, and really this story starts earlier Going about two stories back before it, there is this story of Jesus is teaching to the multitudes and all these people are coming in and Jesus' mom and his brothers and sisters hear about everybody coming to see Jesus and, and what, a, what a great family Jesus had at this time. They immediately conclude Jesus is crazy and they've got to save him because he's embarrassing the family. Aren't you glad families don't work like this anymore, Right? And, and so they go to where Jesus is teaching, and people come, and Jesus is in the middle of something. They go, hey, your, your mom and brothers and sisters are out here to talk to you, and, and they're here to save you from embarrassing them and yourself kind of thing. And, and so Jesus goes through that, teaches his way through, finishes with the crowd, tells the disciples, let's get out of here. Let's go somewhere kind of quiet and relax. So Jesus is on the boat going across the Sea of Galilee at night, and a big storm comes up, and Jesus is taking this little nap, and he's resting, and he doesn't get to finish it because the disciples are panicking, they're screaming, they're running around, they're bailing out the boat, and they wake up, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And, and Jesus has to stop the storm and, and teach the disciples, hey, where's your faith? You know what we're about here? This is what we're going to do. So, so he's dealt with his family, he's dealt with the crowd, he's dealt with the storm, he's dealt with the disciples, and he's ready now for vacation to start. It's, it's time, he gets across, the, they're, they're there at this area called the Gerasenes, that's also called the Decapolis, and in some places in the Bible, and it's this group of 10 cities, in the, kind of in Israel, that at this time are, are filled with Gentiles, and so it's kind of a Gentile enclave in Israel, there on the Sea of Galilee, or near the Sea of Galilee, so, so Jesus is there, he gets out of the boat, he puts his foot on shore, finally at vacation spot, and what happens? He steps out on land, and there meets him a man from the city. Well, Jesus is used to people coming to see him when he gets there, but it says he had demons, and he's naked, and he's been living in the tombs, and so probably not well-maintained. And what we learn as we read from Matthew, there's not just one guy, but two guys. And these guys had a reputation because they attacked people that were coming through that area. And so people had to kind of avoid that area because these two naked guys, which I'll agree, that's probably a good thing to do. We'll find another way to get where we want to go. So naked guys don't attack us. And, and so here they come and they make this run at Jesus. Now, let's admit this. This is kind of funny, right? You can just think, oh, poor Jesus, tired, worn out, and here, what, what else could happen? You know, we usually say, what else could happen? Well, there's always something else that can happen, and it's going to. 
And sometimes we think, well, it's because I said that. I messed it up. No, it was going to happen anyway. And, and it happens. And, and it just seems kind of humorous because we can kind of relate to this. But this man had a real problem. These men have a real problem. And, and what I want us to kind of get at this point is maybe, maybe we've lived a kind of life that we've messed up so much and we're so messed up we've become people's laughing stock. And, and people think we're the funniest story they know. And, and when they're kind of mocking somebody or giving an example of what not to do, don't be like, ha ha, so and so. You know what? Jesus doesn't see the joke in that. He sees you and he sees your brokenness. And he cares. And Jesus cares that Luke just covers the story of this man. So I'll go back to just the story of this one man that Luke focuses on and not both of them. But Jesus does this for both of them. But, but this, this man that, that Jesus is dealing with, and it says that he's demon-possessed. And I realize that we're in modern times now, and we've got psychology. We understand people are crazy now. It's hard for us to accept that it could be something that involves demons. That's uncomfortable to us. And we don't want to believe that, that such a thing would happen, that a demon would come and, and be able to possess a person. It just, just doesn't seem real. The, the truth is they're just crazy. Well, sometimes they may be crazy. And it may be a mental condition. But let me assure you, demons are very real. And demon possession is very real. And somebody says, well, how can you be so sure of that? I personally have dealt with some. So I can, I can promise you. But also, i got something even better than my personal experience, because sometimes if people are just going by personal experience and not anchoring things to the word, they're going to make some wrong conclusions about things that they've been dealing with. And so that's what happens when you get away from the word, and you've got to be careful. Somebody says, well, I can tell you what happened to me. Well, maybe it did, and maybe you missed exactly what was really happening there. But we go to the Word, and we have in this story Jesus dealing with demons. Jesus thought they were demons. I'll go with what Jesus says. And we can't say, oh, Jesus didn't know that they were just crazy. Jesus knew they were demons. And, and this demon even gives a name for himself. He says, my name's Legion, when Jesus says, what's your name? And, and Legion's up to, six, a, a troop of soldiers, up to 6,000 people. And we don't know if there was literally 6,000 demons in this man. It's not uncommon that a lot of people are demon-possessed, that they can have multiple demons. And so we don't know if there was actually that many, but we can see from what's going to happen, there's a lot of demons that are in this man. He, there, there's a multitude of them that are there. And so he, he's given himself this, this name Legion for so many demons that are, are possessing him. And, and people that are demon-possessed, they are people who are tormented. We see he doesn't, he's unable to wear clothes. And, and he's going around. It's not uncommon. They're, they scream. They harm themselves. They do all sorts of odd things. They, they often have supernatural strength. And, and we see in this story that, that this guy would break the chains and bonds. They would put people trying to protect him from them and protect him from himself. The people of that town would wrap him in chains and ropes, and he was able to break those. So here's a physically powerful person. He is animated by the power of the demonic. And when people are in this place, it is very common that they do not realize what they are saying or doing. They don't know how this is working and what they, they have no control over themselves to improve their condition. And so here is the irony. You have somebody who is so physically powerful that he can break ropes that are around him. You have somebody that's, that's so physically powerful, he can break literal chains that have been wrapped around him. He can fight off anybody that's, that's coming towards him in this strength that, that he has. But he doesn't have the power to gain spiritual freedom for himself, so he doesn't have to live like that anymore. And here's the crazy thing. And this is where we're going to have a little bit of a hard time making this application. 
I want us to know that this is the extreme end of what Jesus told us the Satan's plan is in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, destroy. This is very extreme. And I got to tell you, I've dealt with this before, but it's, it's, it's pretty rare here in this country. I've talked to missionaries. It's not as rare uh, in other places as it is here, but, but it, it doesn't happen a whole lot here. It, it happens. And so we think, well, praise God for that. But what we've got to get from the story is every person away from Jesus Christ is bound by the enemy. Every person that is away from what Christ wants to do in their life is under the, the threat of Satan to steal, kill, and destroy. This is why we have this, this scripture in Ephesians that, that talks about what life is like without Jesus before he comes into our life. We see this in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So there was no spiritual life in us because of the sin and the things that were in our life in which you once walked following the course of this world. And so you were, you were living in that lifestyle. You were doing what everybody else around you was doing. You thought you were fine. And so you were just living that way, but you were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. We all, everybody, now maybe not demon-possessed, but we all were given to a life without Jesus and we were bound by the things of the world. And so it goes on and it says, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, doing the things we want to do, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What does it mean, children of wrath? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. There is a price to pay for the life we're living. And, and this, you want to know why so many people around us are so miserable? Why there's so many people that hate themselves? Why there's so much strife and turmoil and envy and greed and untruth and all these things in the world? It's because they don't have Jesus. This is what life is like without sin. This is why people are trying to make their lives better. They're grabbing anything that sounds good that they think can make things better. Well, I'm practicing mindfulness. Well, I'm practicing yoga. I'm going after this. I'm going for a counselor. I'm going for this. I'm going for a self-help book. I'm, I'm going to improve my life. I'm going to take ownership. I'm going to read more on this subject. I'm going to, you know, and, and some of those things can be good and wonderful but they're not Jesus, and they will not deliver us from the power of sin and death. Only Jesus can do that, and that's why there are people who are trying so hard. They, they are attempting to be free, but they can't, but most people have just given up, and they've decided this is the way it is. Nothing's ever going to be better. This is just my life's going to stink. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to have to just live with it. And they surrender themselves to a life of hopelessness because the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And when that process is active, hopelessness is all that is left. And so here's Jesus. And he's working. He's trying to make a difference for this guy. Because Jesus has power over sin and death. He's got power over the demonic. He has power to deliver. He has power to bring a new day. And the Bible says that when Christ died on the cross, he, he, defeated, he defeated death in the grave forever. And this power has been given to us. I've had people before say there's things that are in my house and I just, I just you know, I need, I need prayer over it. I need, you know, there's something going on there. And, and I say, you know, I can, I can do that. But you need to do that. You need, to, you need to learn to exercise your authority that belongs to you as a Christian to, to, to tell the devil to get out of your house. Get some oil and say no more in the name of Jesus. This house belongs to God. Take authority over your home. You can do that. Christ gives us that power because he won that power on the cross of Calvary. 
And so here's Jesus dealing with these, these demons and this guy, and, and, and he, you know, they're trying to intimidate him when he says, what's your name? Satan likes to, Satan likes to talk garbage. And, and so what's your name? It's no, it's no just general name. It's, it's a special name. It's a name that should intimidate you, Jesus. We are legion because we are many. Oh, be afraid. Be very afraid. Oh, I bet you're shaking Jesus. You're not going to intimidate Jesus. You're getting ready to make Jesus happy because he's getting ready to see a lot of demons run out of that guy. This is, this is what Jesus came for. Jesus came to set us free. We are here as a testimony of the freeing power of Jesus Christ. And, and so they, they're trying to intimidate Jesus, but they realize this isn't working, so they go to plan B. They begged him. They said, please, don't make us go to the abyss. I think abyss? What in the world is, you know, there was a movie called The Abyss. You go watch a movie? No. The abyss is the bottomless pit. It's hell. And, and they are saying, they know there's a day coming that they are going to be put in there for all of eternity. They just don't want to go now. They're avoiding this as long as they can. They know what it is. And I always feel bad for these poor dumb people who talk about hell like it's a party. What? You know, that's, that is a, a, an incredible example of deep ignorance. For anybody thinking that hell is going to be a good place, not even the demons that hell was created for want to be in hell. They know. And so the moment somebody opens their mouth and goes, well, I'll ready all my friends to be there. We'll have a party. There'll be a cold one waiting on me. The only thing waiting on you is a life of regret and eternity of misery. Goodness gracious, if you want to prove that you don't know what you're talking about, start talking about hell like it's a good time. Because right now, you will tell me so fast that you are totally ignorant and don't know anything. And so these demons themselves are, are saying, please, Jesus, don't put, us, it, don't put us there. Don't make us go to the abyss. See, they recognize the power of Jesus to do with them whatever he wishes. And oddly, they say, well, can we just go into these pigs over here? There's this large herd of swine, and, and, and we, we can just go over there. And, and, and Jesus doesn't command them to go, he allows them to go. And, and we wonder why Jesus would do this. This doesn't seem right, that Jesus would allow these pigs to go, these, these demons to go into these pigs because we, we see this is going to be their destruction. And we ask why, because we, we like animals. Especially pigs, when they're fried up just right on your plate, just bacon in the morning, mmm, that's good stuff, right? Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't in the sermon notes I had today. But, you know, we, we, you know, we hurt for animals. We don't want to see animals like that. That just seems so inhumane. And why would Jesus do that? Well, one, everything belongs to the Lord. And two, this sermon is here for all of eternity to show us the power of the devil, and what he brings things to. This is meant to be a lesson. This is meant to shock us. This is meant to make us think this is terrible. Not that Jesus let him do it, but it's terrible because that's what the devil's wanting to do to you. And so Jesus lets them go, and it says they come out of the man, verse 33, they enter the pigs, and the herd rushes down the steep bank, into the lake and drown. They cannot stand the presence of these demons. It causes them to kill themselves. Now, I will tell you, I've dealt with people who have committed suicide before. And I hear people, you want to make me mad if you're around somebody that's committed suicide and, and I'm there talking to the family and you come up and tell them, well, they're in hell now. I don't know what the family's going to say to you but I'm not going to be too nice to you. You don't know that. You don't have a verse for that. 
It is a terrible loss. It is a painful time, and it is a time that requires people loving on people who have lost somebody important to them that don't understand why it's happened. And there's nothing in the Bible that will indicate that that means they go to hell the moment that happened. But I can tell you this, when somebody is that desperate and hurting that they do that, we should be crying for the pain that they were in. And we should know that Jesus loves them and that they were important to him. And we, we are there to try to go through a mess that we can't understand. And so here, these pigs, they, they're driven. And this is the work of Satan. If, if you're in despair, that's not from God. That's, that's the work of the enemy in your life. And these pigs are so filled with despair, so filled with, with, with anxiety, so filled with all these things that, that they run down and, and they end up killing themselves. And so suddenly the Sea of Galilee features a dead pig flotilla. You can see them out there bobbling on the waves, right? They're just out, out there. And we think, wow, well, that's, that's a painful story. And boy, we want to learn from that, and we can wrap up now, but that's not the end of the story. And, and the point of the story is, as I'm reading it today, is are we going to let God do something that brings us to freedom so we don't have to be those dead pigs? We don't have to be the people that are being tormented. We don't have to be the people that, that cannot be in relationship with those who are around us. We don't have to be the people living for the world, doing what everybody else does. We can be free. We can be living for Jesus. We can know joy. We can know peace. We can know love. This is a story of hope in the midst of, a, of, of an ugly story of what Satan was trying to do. And so we see that there are these guys that are, you know, we always hear sheep herders in the Bible because they're Jews and Jews don't eat pigs. But these guys are Gentiles and they had the wonderful job of being pig herders. And this sounds kind of nasty to me. I don't know about you guys spending your life following pigs around. But here they are, they're pig herders and they've seen what's happening. They've witnessed this. And, and it doesn't say all this directly but we can pretty well connect dots here and figure out what's going on. So they've watched their livelihood drown themselves. And, and they are, these guys, are kind of the original internet trolls. They're, they're going, you know, what internet trolls do. They always talk about how offended they are or, or they attack everybody around them. And so they, they come out and they're just throwing all this stuff. And so these guys seem to be that. They, they take off and it says they went to the city and they went all about the country. And what are they saying? The guy that, that was our friend is better now. Praise God. No. That Jew teacher we've heard a little bit about. He just killed all the pigs. I hope you weren't expecting a Christmas ham this year that's floating out there in the Sea of Galilee, the demon inside it. Go on and take as many as you want. They're free. Now, they're belittling Jesus. They're, they're announcing that what Christ has, did, has done is not something good. It's not about the freedom of this man. It's about what they have lost. They have lost their income. They've lost something that they were doing. And, and, and so therefore, they're seeing the minus. And I want you to know that Satan's goal is that you will always see the minus and you will never see the plus of what God wants to do in your life. And this is the role of spiritual laggards. They are out there, and they will speak bad about Jesus. They will put him down. They will make fun of you for being in church. They will, they will do, say and do anything, expect it, and know what they are trying to do is to minimize and undo the good things that God has done in you because you are the man who is sitting there, who has been made well and delivered you are a testimony to the world. You are a light that cannot be hidden. You are the salt of the earth. And his laggards want to say, oh, it's nothing. It's a loss. Don't even consider it. But Jesus delivers. Jesus 
sets free. And so people, they hear this. People like seeing dead pigs floating on the sea, don't we? They like seeing, we say, I don't want to see a car accident. Well, why are you slowing down to two miles an hour and driving your car out because you're over there watching all this stuff? And we, we, we just can't turn our eyes from these things. And I got to think of the days of Jesus. There probably wasn't a lot of interesting things going on around. And so these people hear this story and, and what's going to happen? They went out to see what happened. And they come to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demons had gone. Now, to Jesus, this man was a stranger. But to these people, this was the guy that some of them had been babysitting when they tied him up and he broke the chains and chased them away. To some of these people, he was probably a relative. And some of these people, this was probably the guy they went to high school with. This was the guy that worked at McDonald's with them back a few years ago. This was, this was somebody they knew. And they had watched his decline. They had watched his destruction. This should have been something that brought them joy because it says that he's sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind. And they said, hallelujah, God's alive. No, they were afraid. I don't know what's caused this. I don't know if this is good. This, is, this looks kind of scary to me. This, it, they, they're not considering what Jesus has done. They're just looking at what it may cost them. Or if this might be painful, or if this might be a problem. And we get this today. I was telling Laurel, we were driving around uh, yesterday, and, and, and actually we were making a Slurpee run to the 7-Eleven, which is an important part of every Saturday for, in my home. And, and so we were, we were making our Slurpee run. I said, Laurel, you know, when, when I was younger, there were a lot of people that wouldn't receive Christ, but when their life fell apart, there was just kind of this understanding, you need Jesus. And, and they'd end up in church. They'd get life, their life right. They'd turn back around. But I said, I've witnessed over the years of my ministry that we live in a time that people don't even know who Jesus is. And, and the ones who do, there are people who are actively working to keep them from Christ. And so this is kind of this fear that, that we're seeing here. And, and, you know, this is the introduction. John chapter 1, I always love, is this introduction to Jesus and John the Baptist's ministry. But I love where it talks about Christ coming. And there's this, this verse there that just kind of, just kind of or a couple verses that, that, that kind of trouble me because verse 9 and 10 of John 1 says, the true light, Jesus, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. They didn't understand the life their creator had for them. They didn't understand. And, and so here's this guy, though, that's a testimony to the light of the world has come. There's freedom for everybody. And he's sitting there. How long has it been? We don't know how long it's been since they've seen this guy with actual clothes on. That had to be a nice thing to see in its own right. And so finally, naked guy's wearing clothes. And he's in his right mind. And, and we should go to this. There's something wonderful that's happened here. I know some other demon-possessed people. I know people who are sick and need healing. I, I know people that need to know what in the world's gone on here so they can have some hope. I know that things can be turned around and they can be different. All these things should have been going through their mind because the hope that was found by that man means that there's a hope available for every person. And, and so their families that they've seen going through all this stuff, this is the opportunity. So what do they do? Then all the people of the surrounding country, the garrison, so this is a committee project, these 10 towns, ask him to depart from them for they were seized with great fear. So, they got in the boat, and he returned. See, Jesus is not going to force himself on us. He's not going to make us break through our fear of him and turn things around whether we like it or not. He gives us the choice. This is called free will. It is part of being a creation. This is not a world of robots. 
we are not robots. We are people that had to make our own decision of whether or not we would accept Christ. We would receive him and follow him. And so these people have chose to live as laggards away from the opportunity of Jesus Christ. But there's one person, I love this end of the story, the man from whom the demons had gone, he begged that he might be with them. And what's Jesus say? I know Jesus probably wanted to say, come on, let's go. But Jesus said, go home and declare how much God has done for you. They won't listen to me, they won't receive me, but they're not going to be able to not deny what's happened to you. You can glorify, and this is the best, this is the best testimony. You know, we, I meet people all the time, well, I can't witness, I don't know verses well enough, and I don't, I don't understand all the theology, and people may ask questions that make me uncomfortable. You know, all you need to know is this, Jesus saved you and changed your life. Nobody can argue with what God has done for you. And so this is what we're sharing. This is what Jesus is saying. This guy, he didn't say, take this Bible, and here is, here is the card. This has a QR code on it. You get your phone, go on there. This is a six-year Bible course that once you take it, you will be able to explain to them what I have done for you. So, so get to work, and in six years, you'll be ready to tell people. No, Jesus said, go home. Go back, because they're, they're not going to be able to deny what's happened to you, and you just start telling them, and I love this, and he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. We are here this morning in this house because of what Jesus has done for us. We are the testimonies. We are clothed and in our right mind. Praise God for that. Because of what Jesus has done for us. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't, you haven't yet accepted him. You're still at this place. You're away and, and you're crying out in your heart, I want to be free from this mess. I want to start living for Jesus. I'm not saying you're demon-possessed, but I'm just saying you need what Jesus can do for your life. Maybe you're watching on live stream this morning and, and, and you've got, there's just things in your life that need to be turned around. I'm here to tell you what you haven't been able to do, Jesus can do for you. He can do it for all of us. And so I'm going to ask you right now to just bow your head, and I want us just to open our hearts as we're bowing our heads and just say, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Some of us, some of us, we're, we're, you know, we're already Christians, most of us, and, and, and so the Spirit, we should just be feeling just, just the reassurance of what he's done for us. Doesn't mean our life's always perfect and there's no problems, but it means that we got God on our side, and he's going to get us through. So we should be feeling just kind of this, this, this presence and God just saying, I love you and I'm with you and, and, and I'm going to keep my hand on you. There's some of us here that the Holy Spirit saying, I want, I want to give you some new life. I love what Nick said this morning as, as he was led by the Holy Spirit and was talking about this very thing. I want, to, I want to bring you from spiritual death to spiritual life. I want you to, to be delivered from those things that have been tearing you apart. Those, those things that you've tried and you've just kind of given up on. You've decided that's the way it is. I, I, I'm here to tell you right now, that's not the way it is. God wants to give you a new start. And I just wonder, is there anybody here that will lift their hand right now and say, Pastor, I need that new start. I need to be set free. I need a new beginning. Those of you on live stream, you can raise your hand right where you are this morning. Anybody, just lift their hand and say, Pastor, I need it. Amen. I'm seeing some hands going up this morning. Amen. God's seeing your hand. He, he, he's hearing your cry. There is, there is freedom. There is a way from the world around you and what you've been drugged along and to being a part of. There is freedom for you in this place this morning. We're going to say for all of us who raised our hands on live stream and in this place, we're going to pray a prayer right now. And this is going to be a prayer. All of us are going to pray together. But it's a prayer for anyone who lifted their hand, even if they didn't. If they pray this prayer, this will be your start in following Jesus. Will you pray with me this morning, Heavenly Father? 
I know I've done wrong. I'm tired of living like this. I can't go on anymore. I need freedom. Lord, bring me to your life that I may truly live and be the person you created me to be. Thank you for this opportunity to follow you and to live in your blessings. In your name, Jesus.